This is Y490 Politics of the Internet. This lecture was originally delivered on March 7th, 2012. The lecture concerns the governance of the Internet. Governance is a service that governments and other authoritative bodies perform. It's been defined by Orrin Young as the establishment and operation of social institutions capable of resolving conflicts, facilitating cooperation, or more generally, alleviating collective action problems. International intergovernmental regimes are systems of rules, norms, procedures, and informal practices that constrain the behavior of governments of nation states. International governance and international governmental regimes are not the same because some international governance can occur with only minimal involvement of governments. The international regimes for information and communication technologies include, among others, the domain name system, uh, the international regime for e-commerce, which is still in its infancy, intellectual property rights and digital rights management, uh, the Bridging the Digital Divide initiative of the G7, G8, uh, also called the DOT Force, and uh, the Internet Governance Forum, which started off as the WSIS, or WSIS. The domain name system uh, was originally a system administered by a single individual, John Postel, at, uh, at the University of Southern California. Uh, Postel basically uh, created a regime in which you would go to him personally uh, in order to establish uh, a set of numbers, uh, for a unique set of numbers for a website uh, or for a node on the internet. And uh, that later became generalized as the Internet Assigned Numbers Association, or IANA, uh, which was then run by the Internet Society. The IANA established uh, ICANN uh, under the, with cooperation of the U.S. Department of Commerce later on, uh, and uh, that came under strong criticism because it gave to the U.S. Department of Commerce a veto over decisions made by the body. Basically, the idea for ICANN was to internationalize the governance of the domain name system. Uh, the DNS, uh, it, the domain name system, involves maintaining a set of at least 12 uh, root servers which all contain key crucial information about the internet that makes, allows it to run. Um, there's a system not only of numbers but of names that are associated with those numbers so that both the names and the numbers are unique so that there's no confusion about where a message is going from or where a message is going to. Um, there are global top-level domains, uh, which are the most important ca ca category of, uh, of domain names. Um, so, for example, .com or .edu or .gov, those are all top-level domains. And then alongside that is a system of country domains with uh, a dot with two letters following it, which would be like dot fr for France or uh, dot de for Germany. Uh, the need to regulate the issuance of domain names, uh, the licensing of domain names, uh, originally was uh, resulted in the formation of a private company called Network Solutions, later called VeriSign. Uh, which then was empowered with the ability to check to see that a domain number and name was uh, unique and then to, uh, to uh, grant the right of using that to a particular uh, individual or company. Uh, one of the problems that came up early on, what was called cyber squatting, this is where you would sit on a domain name or number uh, and, uh, and, and charge some ex exorbitant price for the company or the individual who actually wanted that domain um, to buy it away from you. Uh, also, some people would violate other people's trademarks or brand names by creating domain names that were similar to those brand names. And this resulted in a, uh, a, 
dispute resolution uh, system called the UDRP. Uh, one of the most important controversies over the uh, DNS was the fairly recent dispute over the creation of a .xxx domain. That would be a top-level domain devoted entirely for pornography. Um, one of the ideas behind this was to prevent, uh, to, to put all the pornographic sites in one top-level domain, um, but basically a lot of people objected to it because they'd already paid for uh, .com or other kinds of uh, uh, domain names, um, and it was seen as a, as a way of simply getting money out of them. Um, and on the other hand, uh, conservatives, social conservatives thought of .xxx as making it sort of easier to put pornography on the internet. Um, under the question of e-commerce, uh, the question was, should there be policies to promote the br pr migration from bricks and mortar to bricks and clicks or just clicks? Uh, that is to put more commerce onto the internet um, as opposed to less. And uh, how to regulate it, how to tax it more specifically, uh, where to um, where to specify a geographic location for taxation purposes uh, and uh, what level of tax is to be charged. There's been quite a lot of attention to uh, governance issues revolving around the protection of intellectual property. Uh, the recording industry and the motion picture industry have both uh, attacked file sharing of uh, copyrighted material uh, as injurious to their industries and and to the creative process more generally. Uh, others others have argued, such as Larry Lessig, who's depicted below there, uh, that um, too ambitious digital rights management and intellectual property pr pr uh, protection would go counter to the need to share um, various kinds of intellectual property to create. Uh, new works of art or new um, new intellectual works. So there's two books by Larry Lessig uh, mentioned there that deal with this question uh, Free Culture and Remix. Just a, uh, a fake uh, horror comic a picture depicting uh, the uh, the lurid tales of file sharing by the RIAA. Uh, one of the more famous stories about um, the sort of the taking of intellectual property is um, based on a story that was originally appeared in Salon.com and then uh, has, has been repeated in a Wikipedia entry. Um, and um, basically, uh, somebody got a copy, a, a digital copy of um, the. Uh, the Star Wars movie featuring Jar Jar Binks, uh, and um, apparently an individual took the digital copy and edited out all what he considered to be offensive passages that included Jar Jar Binks, uh, and many people thought that was a better movie than the original. Uh, George Lucas originally thought this was cool, but then later on he realized that this wasn't so cool for his business uh, interests, and he reversed himself on that. Uh, this chart basically summarizes the history of the Copyright Act and shows how it's been expanded over the years to cover new media and uh, to some degree to become more ambitious. Um, there, uh, the length of copyright protection has been uh, increased over the years. One of the more recent versions of that was in 1976 when uh, the term of a copyright um, beyond the life of the author was 50 years. Now it's 70 years um, for corporations and 95 years uh, for publications. Uh, the Copyright Extension Act of 1988, which was sponsored by Sonny Bono, uh, sometimes also called the Mickey Mouse Protection Act, uh, extended copyright terms to 95 years after publication. So. Um, there you go. Uh, you can see that this wasn't the first time that copyright links had been extended. Uh, starting with the 1790 Act, you have 1831, 
1906, 1962, 74, 76, and 98. Uh, one of the interesting stories around Hollywood that is uh, kind of tells you where some of the Hollywood uh, big players come from. Uh, Walt Disney was uh, uh, digged in the early days of his career when he worked for uh, uh, Charles Mintz at Universal Studios, uh, created a character called Oswald the Rabbit uh, in 1927. Uh, he thought he wasn't being paid enough, so he asked for more money. And uh, his boss, Mr. Mintz, said that Universal owned the rights to Oswald the Rabbit and not Disney, and so Disney uh, wouldn't pay Disney any more money for it. So Disney quit and formed his own studio and decided never again to lose control of his intellectual property. And you can be very sure that the Disney Corporation still understands that lesson today. Uh, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, by the way, looks quite a bit like Mickey Mouse, so you can understand why he was so ticked off. Um, the first Mickey Mouse movie uh, called Steamboat Willie came out in 1928. Uh, more recent intellectual property rights legislation are the Digital Millennium Co Copyright of 1998 and the Inducing Infringements of Copyright Act of 2004. Uh, the DMCA uh, broadened legal coverage for people who uh, claimed that their intellectual property was being infringed upon, uh, and so did the, the 2004 legislation, which extended into the world of, of the Internet by making Internet service providers uh, liable for uh, for certain damages that would occur from uh, too much sharing of, of other people's intellectual property rights. Uh, the DMCA authorized methods for managing digital rights, including licensing, watermarking, register wear, tethering, and, pri and a privacy tax. Uh, it also limited caching, prohibited links to DMCA illegal material, uh, told ISPs to ex expeditiously to block illegal content or activity in the so-called notify and takedown rules. Uh, gave special leeway to libraries, um, but uh, and and gave compulsory licensing to webcasters with terms regulated by the Library of Congress. Um, digital files are unlike analog. Uh, files or you know, analog content because no, there's no loss in quality when digital files are co copied, um, and so it's a little bit more worrisome for the um, for the recording industry and the movie industry. Uh, and uh, this first became clear with the sharing of of MP3 digital audio files. Um, video files are have been more recently a focus of attention. Uh, as the speed of the internet grows and it becomes easier to share um, video files through different new forms of software. Uh, the first company to kind of realize the potential for mp3 file sharing was uh, Napster, founded in June 1999 by Sean Parker and Sean Fanning. Uh, it was one of the first systems to utilize large scale on a large scale the peer-to-peer -peer modeling uh, for peer-to-peer -peer model uh, or P2P model for sharing files. Um, basically, uh, one internet knows is designated to share files with other nodes. Uh, and so the, there's no intervening character. You can have it on one computer or one server and other computers can get access to the file through that server. Um, the first peer-to-peer -peer networks, such as Napster, were client-server based. There was a central server that tended to provide access to files that would be shared. Um, one uh, important band, Metallica, sued Napster uh, when it discovered that a demo of their song, I Disappear, had been circulating across the Napster network even before it had been released. Uh, this led to the song being played on several radio stations across America and also brought to Metallica's attention was that their entire back catalog of studio material was available uh, on Napster. The band responded by filing a lawsuit in 2000 against the company. In November 1999, the RIAA, even before the uh, Metallica suit, in November 1999, the RIAA, the Recording Industry of America, 
filed suit against Napster for copyright infringement. This suit was successful, and Napster, Napster under the uh, under the the uh, conclusion of the suit or under the settlement, had to close it down its operations by July 2001. In, in 2001, Napster already had 26 over 26 million users. Um, not all bands were against Napster and file sharing. Uh, Radiohead, in particular, was uh, very positive about the uh, help that Napster gave them in, in uh, making their album Kid A, uh, a number one album in America. And um, they later on went on to share their own music uh, directly with the public through various illegal means. Uh, a, a new kind of P2P uh, client software was created uh, called uh, under the so-called Nutella network um, category that didn't rely on a single server. Instead, the files could be on different servers, uh, and uh, the user wouldn't necessarily have to get it from a single place. So uh, a whole series of software came up around this concept. Uh, including Grokster, Kazaa, LimeWire, Morpheus, eDonkey, and BearShare. Um, by June 2005, there were almost 2 million nodes for sharing files this way. Uh, by January 2006, there were 3 million nodes. MGM filed suit against Grokster in 2003, and under the, uh, under the um, ruling of the court, Grokster shut down its operation in November 2005. Uh, the next generation of technology was called the BitTorrent. In the BitTorrent, you don't have to have the whole file uh, on a, a one of the computers in the network for it to be shared. Rather, as soon as the file is downloaded uh, to another computer, whatever proportion of the file has been downloaded becomes available to all the other users on the network. So, um, and instead of sort of obtaining a whole file, you would obtain what um, they would call uh, seeds. Um, so uh, it was a much more efficient way of downloading material, uh, digital files on the internet. Uh, you could be getting them simultaneously from uh, many, many different sources. So take, for example, you want to you want to download a, a Led Zeppelin song. This particular uh, slide shows uh, a BitTorrent client called Azurius, uh, which has changed its name to Vuz, V-U-Z-E. Um, and uh, so other people would be simultaneously downloading this song, uh, and as you are completing the download, they would be downloading parts of that file from you as well. Um, so uh, anyway, that's, just, that's the way the, the, that system works. Uh, by 2009, BitTorrent traffic had accounted for 43 to 70 percent of all internet traffic. Uh, Comcast uh, and the, and some of the other uh, in major internet service providers uh, decided to throttle BitTorrent traffic on its network um, because it claimed that it was an interfering with the quality of service to other users. Um, the FCC uh, intervened to stop this, and. Uh, uh, Eventually, Comcast countersued the FCC and won its case. Um, in October 2010, the U.S. District Court, a U.S. District Court judge, filed an injunction against LimeWire, uh, and uh, in, in the continuing uh, effort to take down uh, illegal, what they called illegal file sharing. Uh, and in November 2010, the Department of Homeland Security began to crack down on Torrent Finder, which was a, basically a system to allow you to find BitTorrents uh, on the internet. Uh, a major controversy came up around the so-called the Pirate Bay and the Pirate, and the Pirate Party, was, which was connected with the Pirate Bay. Uh, the founders of the Pirate Bay in Sweden were found guilty of assisting with the violation of copyrights and sentenced to serve prison terms in 2009. Uh, the Pirate Party had been created already in 2006 and has become the model for a global international pirate mark movement. Uh, the movement basically uh, joins people together who think that patent and copyright laws are too strict and that file sharing should be legal. Um, so 
Um, this has actually become an important political factor in European politics, uh, as we'll talk about in future lectures. Uh, so in uh, 2006, uh, the RIA and the MPAA decided to get involved in uh, international trade negotiations uh, by, by proposing uh, changes to uh, trade agreements in a peace a treaty called the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, or ACTA, uh, which would exist outside the World Trade Organization, or WIPO, and the UN. Um, an agreement was signed in October 2011 by the U.S., and then later in January 2012 by the European Union. It looked like it was headed toward uh, an inevitable um, uh, becoming a fact, uh, but in fact uh, it was shot down later on, and I'll talk about that later. So the three guiding questions to this area of, of thinking is to what extent does the internet media sector mimic the long established patterns of concentrated ownership in the broader print and broadcast media? To what extent has it altered the processes shaping the central area of media content that is news production and distribution? And what has been the effect of the phenomenon of file sharing, the rise of open source software and other intellectual property disputes? Uh, clearly, there has been a concentration of control in, in terms of corporate control over mass media in the United States, and we can see that uh, fairly clearly in this chart here. Um, there has been quite a lot of conglomeration of um, media systems, uh, with the big owners being General Electric, Walt Disney, News Corporation, Time Warner, Viacom, CBS, and uh, Bertelsmann. Uh, this uh, diagram uh, called Ultra Concentrated Media Top Selling Brands does a pretty good job, although maybe hard to read, uh, of how these uh, corporations, what kinds of networks they have united uh, in the media world. The film study uh, market share of uh, total film sales uh, is, is displayed in this uh, this. Graphic from 2009, uh, Warner Brothers is the lead, has the leading share of films um, distributed, uh, films sold rather, uh, that is tickets sold for films. The total world box office was about $29 billion, so uh, at 20% uh, we're talking about $6 billion. And uh, the other big players are Paramount, Sony, Columbia, Universal, Buena Vista, 20th Century Fox. So we have here a bunch of authors who have written on this question of media concentration. Ben Bagdikian, The Media Monopoly, Ellie Noam, Media Ownership and Concentration in America, Robert McChesney, Rich Media, Poor Democracy, and Robert McChesney, The Political Economy and Media. Okay, I'm going to talk briefly about the governance of the so-called global digital divide uh, through an effort that was undertaken in the G8 system. Um, in the G8, in its June of July 2000 meeting in Okinawa, uh, agreed to um, some principles, including the principle of inclusion, where everyone everywhere should be enabled to participate and no one should be excluded from the benefits of global information society. Uh, the uh, G8 committed itself to bridging the global digital divide and established a digital opportunity task force, later called the DOT Force. Uh, four areas of action were proposed in the Okinawa Char Charter, fostering policy, regulatory, and ne network readiness, improving connectivity, increasing access, and lowering costs, and building human capacity, and encouraging participation in global e-commerce and other e-networks. Uh, the dot force team created seven uh, dot force created seven teams to deal with these issues in the separate issue areas of national e strategies, access and connectivity, human capacity building, entrepreneurship, ICTs for health, local content and applications, and global policy participation. Uh, the dot force was distinctive from other kinds of initiatives in that it was a multi stakeholder system with uh, not just governments being represented, but also private firms and nonprofits and international organizations. 
uh, was seen to be a response to some of the concerns expressed in the battle in Seattle in 1999. And uh, the G8 was under the leadership of Japan and Canada during these two years of the Dock Forces uh, activities. Final report, report card, Digital Opportunities for All, was presented at the G8 meeting in 2002 in Canada, Kananaskis. Uh, various projects were proposed. Uh, the Dot Force itself ceased operations, but handed off some of its ideas to the UN ICT Task Force and the World Summit on the Information Society in 2003. Uh, the World Summit on the Information Society, or WISIS, uh, was a follow-on to the Dot Force, has had two big meetings, one in Geneva and one in Tunis in 2003, the most recent one uh, was, I guess they continue to be in G Geneva. Um, in any case, uh, there, alongside of WISIS we have had the establishment of the Internet Governance Forum, uh, which sort of all, is another talking shop for uh, Internet governance established by the United Nations Gen Secretary General in 2006 and it continues uh, to meet annually. That's it.